your party has accepted work as Marines aboard a cog called the Otherworldly Obelisk. The ship is birthed in Ragnarheim, a Viking town in New Vinland, with plans to continue on to Port Zangarios. But some of the expected cargo has not arrived. The local trapper was due hours ago with a bundle of valuable ermine pelts. His tardiness is uncharacteristic. The captain orders you to locate the late trapper and, more importantly, return with the pelts. But something is amiss out in the hoary wilds of Hyperborea. I review the late trapper's lament for the old-school Hyperborea RPG coming right up on RPG Retro Reviews. Hello everyone, I'm Captain Courageous and I review old school models and games and try to give them a fun and informative analysis. This week I turn my attention to the latest adventure module released for the Hyperborea RPG from Northwind Adventures. This module was released last year along with the third edition of the Hyperborea role-playing game. For those not in the know, Hyperborea is loosely based on the first edition of Dungeons and & Dragons and incorporates elements from various pulp fantasy authors such as H.P. Lovecraft, Robert E. Howard, and Clark Ashton Smith. And it's Ashton Smith's work on his Hyperborean cycle of, of the stories that serves as the primary inspiration for the setting, as well as some weird science fiction elements. This is my favorite old school RPG and the one I've been playing for about two years now. But before I get into this review, I'd like to give a big shout out to Dungeons and Dragons. Happy 50th anniversary and thank you for all the joy you've given me for 40 years. And also another real quick announcement. I will be at ScrumCon in Silver Spring, Maryland, March 30th, where I will be running Rats in the Walls for the Hyperborea RPG. This will be a modified Deathbringer version. So if you're in the Maryland, Virginia area, I'd love to see you there. All right, now let's get on with this module review. The Late Trapper's Lament is an introductory module and a perfect first edition adventure to begin your new Hyperborea campaign and is designed for first and second level characters. Like most of the Hyperborean modules from Northwind Adventures, this is not just an adventure, but also serves as a setting supplement as it fully details the Viking village of Ragnarheim. Now, if you don't play Hyperborea, but use an old school rule set, like say, for example, old school essentials, this module is still completely compatible with it. You can just place this adventure in any Norse inspired section of your campaign world. If you haven't checked out the Hyperborea RPG, I've done several videos on it, which you can check out right here with this handy dandy Hyperborea playlist I've made. This adventure was written by David Prada, whose name some might recognize, as he was co-developer for the Osric role-playing game. The adventure begins with the heroes working for Captain Falcatos, a merchant captain aboard the cog of the worldly obelisk. When I ran this, I just had my players explain to me why they boarded the vessel and took on this type of work. Most were simply deckhands, and in general, the module lays out the ideas of setting off the Sikh adventure and fortune in a foreign port. The opening blurb has the PCs leaving the independent port city of Cromarium, hauling various goods for market to Port Sangarios, the City of Masks, which is definitely one of the more exciting destinations in Hyperborea. The city itself is said to be a favorite of the rogue god Rel, and by law all residents must wear a mask in public which are usually quite elaborate, with wealthy citizens coming up with a very stylish and elaborate mask. But before arriving at Port Zangarius, the otherworldly obelisk must make a stopover at Seawolf Isle and the Viking town of Ragnarheim, where they must pick up some very valuable giant ermine pelts. This is where a bit of trouble begins, as the expected cargo is not at the warehouse when the ship arrives. Ragnarheim is a very authentically done, Viking Village, and Prada's knowledge of names and proper Norse pronunciation and punctuation is very impressive. 
I say this because I consulted my friend Lexi, who has a master's in medieval literature and language and served as a consultant for the video game Assassin's Creed Valhalla. She was very impressed with the module's Viking content. Consequently, some of the names are a bit of a challenge to pronounce, but I'll do my best to apply Lexi's advice and not mangle the names for this review too much. As a side note, there is another Hyperborean adventure involving Ragnar the Seawolf, the Seawolf's daughter. Running The Late Trapper's Lament first can serve to familiarize the players with this very prominent NPC in this area of Hyperborea, which can lead to later adventures. Given the need to set sail to meet other obligations with his cargo, Captain Falcatios enlists the aid of the PCs to try and find the trapper, Ulf, and why he's late in trying to get the pelts to the docks. Ulf is well-known and a well-liked trader and typically very dependable, so this failure to show is cause for concern. When talking to the Viking Warfinger, the PCs can further learn that the trapper has a son named Uli who has just completed his first cycle. For those who don't play in Hyperborea, the setting has a long year of light and dark, winter through summer that lasts 13 years. Thus, Uli is 13 years old. They can also learn that Olaf's wife, Asni, is said to be with child. Now, spoiler warning for the next part, as the major secret of the module was revealed, if you might want to play in this module, here's a good stopping point. Okay, are you still with me? What has happened is that Eric Thad Marson, an exile Viking priest of Kraken, made a beach landing on the island a day earlier. His henchman and a warlock named Fracky Stein Grimson accompanied him as well as five zombies. Eric is seeking a lost pirate treasure alleged to have been secreted here seven centuries prior. Eric's map led to a small cave appropriated by a colony of giant weasels. In the ensuing battle, two weasels escaped, but not before they had contracted zombieism. Unfortunately, those infected weasels found their way to Olaf's jaw traps. When the trapper found the desiccated creatures, he assumed they were dead. Unfortunately, Olaf realized his mistake too late and was bitten by the zombie weasel. The trapper fled, dropping his haul of pelts back to his family's cabin, unaware of the deadly disease he had contracted. Now, here is where the module makes a stroke of genius. Exactly how the PCs ultimately discover the situation at the cabin depends entirely on how they approach their task. If they delay too long in Ragnarheim, the situation at the cabin will be quite dire when they finally arrive. Thus, time is of the essence, but it's not exactly the referee's job to convey this, simply allowing events to unfold based on the PC's choices. The module lists a timeline of events that will transpire, thus it is very important that the referee keep good track of time, relaying to PCs the time at frequent intervals, perhaps subtly hinting to them of the importance of time. Here you can see the issue. You must find the cabin, deal with the zombies, and perhaps trace back the pelts which they were sent to recover and get back to the otherworldly obelisk before it departs the next day. In addition, saving Olaf's wife and son will be difficult if no one can remove disease if they arrive after Olaf's transformation and he's infected his family. Here you can see that a full page is dedicated to the exact situation found at the cabin depending on when and what time the PCs arrive there. If they are lucky, they can learn from Asni what happened and perhaps deal with Olaf either curing him or putting him in down before he infects his family. Tracing back Olaf's steps, possibly using a map they discovered at the cabin, they can attempt to track down the drop pelts they came for by searching the four traps that Olaf set. But unfortunately, by that time, the warlock Fracky will have found the drop pelts and taking them to the cave where the renegade kraken priest Eric digs with his zombies and henchmen for lost pirate treasure. If the PCs delay too long, the entire family will have turned to zombies, but a bit of searching of the cabin will uncover a letter from Olaf that might clue them in on their next steps. The weasel's blood trail will lead from trap D to this hidden cave. 
They can also discover the tracks to Eric's zombies and other henchmen, either reverse tracking them back to the Priest Vikings Sixer Ring ship, currently beached, or investigate the pirate caves. Blood from the weasels and the many pairs of boot prints leading to the cave's entrance surely indicates the origin of the zombie infection and the location of Ulfer's lost pelts. Entering the cave were revealed the bodies of a giant weasel and two pups bludgeoned to death, as well as a dismembered left forearm which looks to be several weeks old. Following to the rear of the first cave, a passage leads to a second large cavern, and here a bloated one-armed zombie with the glaucious pallor of a drowned man with instructions to guard against intruders. Now the module transitions into a more traditional dungeon crawl through the pirate's cave and the discoveries therein. Here the BCs can explore this mysterious cavern, perhaps dispatching the priest and his zombies and taking up the search for lost pirate treasure themselves. There is also a lot to explore here with some very dangerous traps, a bizarre water-filled temple, and like every good Hyperborean module, much of it connects back to the setting's history, culture, and strange mysteries of beings that occupied the lands long before the coming of humans. When my players went through this, they dispatched the priests, his henchmen, and zombies and explore the cavern's depths. Of course, by the time they did all of this, the otherworldly obelisk had long since set sail to Port Zangarios. They took Eric's Sixer Ring and set sail for the islands themselves, and when they arrived, searched for Captain Falcatos to return the pelts and get their reward. This also helped establish them at Port Zangarios where they still are, as of this writing, going on many adventures. Let me take a moment to go into additional detail about Ragnarheim, which is excellently done, a very authentically recreated Viking village. This can serve as a setting for many additional adventures as well. The module goes into detail on the economics of the place, how it supports itself in a way that doesn't necessarily entail raiding and pillaging, the religious practices, as well as major NPCs of the place. There's a vivid history of Ragnar and his daughter Gunhild. Of course, Ragnar's wife Gera was killed in battle when Gunhild was very young, when the island was beset by what's described here as an army of faceless devils, which you can learn in another Hyperborean module. The Sea Wolf's daughter were night gaunts. But all facets of the village's major NPCs are detailed here, thus providing a rich springboard in which to tell additional stories. The artwork throughout this entire module is top-notch, from the cover art by Mike Tenebre to the interior pieces by Jonathan Bingham, Mike Furnett, Glenn Seal, Del Tegler, and Tenebre himself are the best in the OSR by far. So much talent in this one module. The cartography by Andres Claren and Glenn Seal is also a top-notch production. So, let's go ahead and take a look at the late Trapper's Lament on my D20 scale of style, presentation, and value. Style-wise, gosh man, I love this module so much. If you follow this channel at all, you know how much I adore the Hyperborean setting, and adventures like this one are exactly why. There's a lot of classic D&D tropes here, but every one of them takes advantage of the rich Hyperborean setting and what it offers. The artwork, the layout, Jeffrey Talanian is doing an amazing job of bringing together top-notch talent to produce the best fantasy RPG supplements for the OSR that I've seen. I'm going to rate this a natural 20. Likewise, the presentation is clever and interesting. I especially liked the way the adventure changes based on how much time it takes the heroes to get to Olaf's cabin, and that's an integral part of the adventure. I love the pirate cave, its connection both to the setting and the Lovecraftian mythos. My group had a blast with this module, and I will only have one minor nitpick here in that perhaps a Viking pronunciation guide would have been helpful. Not everyone has a friend with a master's in medieval literature and languages that they can tap as a consultant to pronounce this stuff. Like the R in Eric and Brunhild is silent. 
and many other interesting quirks of language that the common English speaker may or may not be aware of, which, if you're interested in trying to bring authenticity to your Viking setting, might be important. I know space is a consideration to be sure, and there is the internet, but you sort of have to know that you don't know in order to look up things, right? So I was lucky enough to have a friend who knows such things and sit down with her module in hand and go over the various names. Thank you, Lexi. So with all of that being said, I'll rate this a 19. Finally, let's talk value. You can pick up either the PDF at DriveThruRPG for just $10 or the print version from Northwind Adventures for $20. Let me say that the print version is a very high quality, heavy cardstock cover, clear, concise printing. The hex maps of the Seawolf Island are printed on the inside cover. The overview map on one side and then the more detailed lower scale map on the other side of the island's northern territory where the adventure takes place. I really like having the PDF myself so that I can print out the dungeon map and the various handouts, which is a parchment map of Olaf's traps, as well as Olaf's letters to his wife, Asni. So, for me at least, this was a $30 purchase. I don't think that's too much, considering that you're going to get the initial two to three game sessions for the module itself, as well as coverage of Seawolf Island and Ragnarhorn. I'll go ahead and write this in 18. And that brings the overall rating for Hyperborea's Late Trapper's Lament to a 57. Amazing. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this review. And next week, I'm going to take a historical look back to the first edition Advanced Dungeons & Dragons hardcover supplement, Deities and Demigods. I'd like to take a moment to thank my patrons for their support. Without them, this channel is just not possible. Please help me out with a like, comment, and share. Subscribe and click the little bell so you get notifications when I upload new content. Please check out my Teespring store, Ye Old School Shop, for some fun gaming swag, t-shirts, carry bags, coffee mugs, and more. Consider supporting me on Patreon as well. And if you feel inclined to send a tip, you can do so through my PayPal tip jar or super thanks right here. The link for everything is in the description. And as always, my friends, may your d20 roll true and game on. <laughs>